was here after Chief Dan George from the Slavo Tooth Reserve in North Vancouver had already become a beloved elder to many Canadians. Bruno Giussi starred in what seemed like a never-ending hit, playing a driftlog salvager in the weekly CBC TV series, The Beach Combers. That Jimi Hendrix's grandmother, Nora, had worked as a chef at Vice Chicken and Steakhouse for years while living on East Georgia Street in Chinatown, and that her guitar wizard grandson had stayed with her many times and sharpened his chops at Monday night rocking sessions in the clubs around the main and Hastings corner only added to the sense that this was a place that had known famous times, had sprung some big names, that things could happen here. Among writers, Malcolm Lowry had spent the better part of 15 years nearby struggling with the making of his celebrated novel Under the Volcano and a series of cloudy follow-ups. Poet Earl Burney had established the country's first creative writing program out at UBC, currently in the news for all the wrong reasons. And Maria Fiamengo, an ardent nationalist, had established a feminist ethic in poetry from the early 1960s onward and was outstandingly supportive of other writers. English professor Warren Tolman from the same school had been instrumental in inviting writers from the American Black Mountain and Beat Spectrum to the city for almost two decades, as well as shepherding many former students into teaching and media careers of significance. Novelist Margaret Lawrence and future Nobel Prize winner Alice Munro both lived and worked in the city during formative stages in their careers, while the luminous Ethel Wilson wrote for decades from her home overlooking English Bay. The late 1960s through to the 80s was a time of Pierre Trudeau-era nationalist arts funding to Canadian journalists, and British Columbia had a budding regional literary and publishing scene. In step with Vancouver's emerging non-academic growth in literary publishing was its own downtown pulse. Pulp Press had an office up the street, and I think Ashma Rhodes got some of the old newsletters from, uh, from Pulp Press here, as well as some of the old literary storefront newsletters that circulated and kept everybody in the loop in this town, before we had a lot of official, a lot of official culture. He's brought these today. Great to see him. Since the 1960s, poet Bill Bissett had been running Blue Ointment Press from a secret location, laying <laughs> on his living room floor or conducting contract talks from the nearest phone booth. Some of his best contracts were written on postcards, and he sought out and published many new, especially downtown poets. Downtown Eastside poet Jerry Gilbert's bibliograph, BC Monthly, had survived from 1972 onward. A little more history. Vancouver remained a swingy neon town, renowned among North American musicians for the high tenor of its talent and nightlife. The Main Street and Hastings cabaret district that sent acts like Cheech and Chong, Bobby Taylor and the Vancouver's, and others of stardom was entering its last stand. The Lotus Hotel across the road from the old Vancouver Sun building remained a favorite watering hole, and up-and-coming writers still hoped to meet veterans like the Vancouver Sun's Alan Fotheringham, Jack Webster, and Marjorie Nichols here from time to time. Five minutes away, at the north end of Granville, there was still a colonial-era atmosphere with fine tailors, upscale shoe emporia, James English Reed's grand old British butcher shop, and Woodward's dollar forty-nine day. Free parking in the immediate area was always an inducement to downtown shoppers. Meanwhile, bookstops flourished, new and used. Duffy's, McLeod's, Colophon, Richard Pender, William Hoffer, and the leftist outlet Spartacus, still in bloom, were all aflame. For Bohemian diehards, the classical joint on Carroll Street was the town's perennial late evening jazz nexus. A handful of Irish pubs and run of the mill watering holes opened early for the era's large population <coughs> of single room occupants, old loggers, fishermen, boonmen, miners, and sundry veterans who somehow slipped through the social net. Working class, shake and shimmy, down at heel, creative and cheap. The gas town, downtown east side district was a natural magnet for the young, an artist with a dream, and for outsiders of every social hue. It was the ideal location for a walk-in literary center. It still is. 
my own encounter with the literary storefront came by word of mouth. I was riding in a car downtown, crammed among new faces after reconnecting in the Royal City's running trails with Ronnie Tabak. We'd been schoolmates, and he got onto pop stardom as a magnetic singer with Prism, one of Vancouver's first international rock acts. Ronnie and I ran long distance in high school. Tall and lean, he'd always been a little faster than I was. Ronnie stuttered, but he let his hair grow long and he could shake it. And when he belted out a chart busting tune like Armageddon, all the glitches disappeared and you knew you were listening to a real star. Ronnie lived the pop world high life for a few years. I'd seen his posters for a huge concert in New York Central Park when I'd been out on the road hustling myself, doing readings back east. His gold records had that sparkle dust up on the wall at his place up the road near the old St. Mary's Hospital. Now we're in a car full of Ronnie's pals, jamming out the windows. Susie Witten, a blues singer, asked who I was. Flipping my notebooks to the poems I wrote to keep myself sane and a heavy day job, I said I was a writer. Susie reached through the mob for a scan of my lines. You want to get down to the storefront and read these, she said. What? The literary storefront in Gastown. My friend Mona runs it. Go down to an open mic session. Listen to the other poets. Get up and read your stuff. Two or three poems like that. See what people think. One Sunday, I took Susie's advice. The first thing you noticed after you climbed the stairs at Gaslight Square at 131 Water Street was the storefront's brickwork. <coughs> funky and kind of cozy like North Beach near City Lights in San Francisco. People read in turn, kind of like here. There were a lot of women. I waited, listening. Nobody got put down. When I was invited up, it all went fine. People offered polite applause. It was my first public reading in town. During a break, someone explained that it was a women's group reading. Feminists, lesbians. In my newness, my enthusiasm, I'd missed all that. When I'd given my name to read, someone had simply noticed I'd traveled some distance and they'd been decent enough to give me a shot. When the penny dropped, I smiled at their kindness, nodded in thanks, and left soon after. I'd return many times. For young writers like me, the literary storefront was an unofficial postgraduate education center. It was where a generation of Vancouver writers surfing somewhere between the nationalist and the as yet unformed multicultural waves in can lit could learn how the writing and publishing game tipped away. But when I'm thinking of before the multicultural wave, where were guys like Ash were going to read and his wife Sergei Kalsi, you know? Where was Joy Kagawa going to read? It was places like the storefront that made it possible. They were, they were the alternatives. They were unfunded by the government, grassroots, democratic, they made possible events like this, because until then, events like this didn't exist. The storefront gave us the template for reading events like this. That's why we're here. Well, at that same moment, at the Smiling Buddha or any other rundown club that would have them, a similar generation of young punk rockers was figuring out the music world, and a new wave of young painters was figuring out reimagining their creative missions in the common low-rent environments of Gastown, Chinatown, the downtown east side. Meantime, downtown, the Vancouver School of Art still featured some writing-related events, meetings, talks, and the Alcazar Hotel growing CD at the corner of Dunsmuir and Homer was a particular favorite watering hole of the town's creative arts community. The video in at 261 Powell hosted events, and a few blocks later, you meet the Vancouver Art Gallery, 111 West Georgia Street, West Georgia, where literary events such as the memorable reading with Russian poet Evgeny Yevtushenko took place in 74. Against this background, in 78, the literary storefront we came to know and love so well would emerge right out of the starting blocks as an incubator for the literary arts in a Pacific Coast town that had long been more devoted to hard work and real estate speculation than literature. Devoted to writers and writing, highbrow literary theory from Paris or East Coast universities never transplanted well in the literary storefront's earthy, practical loan. The storefront hosted events it endured financial wobbles of every sort, not uncommon for most nonprofit art organizations. 
like Poetic Justice and all the others. That's what made the place as likable as it was. It was the gas down donkey engine in the West Coast art scene chugging along indomitably toward the word, the sound, the beat. Ironically, that wasn't far from the mission that its founder, Mona Fertig, a working class poet, girl, and young literary organizer from Burnaby had envisioned when she realized what she could do now that she'd grown up. Here then is the way it was at the literary storefront when, in the pursuit of happiness, Mona Fertig, Vancouver's legendary, unaffiliated literary force, hung out a shingle at age 24. We could still do it those ages. And single-handedly got Vancouver's writing and literature jumping in a whole new way. It was a courageous idea, an enormous accomplishment for a young woman whose life so far, while rich in art and creative inspiration, had flirted around and faced down the poverty line. Heaven only knows what so many of us in the West Coast literary community would have done without it. Hail to the muse. Thank you.